Hello, everybody, and welcome to our updated talk on epilepsy. Uh, this will be an update to a lecture that I gave uh, going on 10 years ago. So it is time for an update. There are some differences now in terminology. Some new drugs have been introduced, um, but we're, I'm going to stick to keeping this fairly short and um, high yield for step two and step three. There are a few other things that you'll need to know for step one that I'm not going to go into, but I will point out uh, where you should do a little bit more research um, when it comes down to the mechanisms of some of these drugs. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the i button on the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already stepped up to donate. And if you haven't, definitely feel free to subscribe to my channel. You can just click on that little button in the bottom right hand corner and uh, hit the subscribe button. Okay, so we're going to talk about epilepsy here. There is another um, manifestation of seizures called status epilepticus, which is a uh, protracted seizure. And I talk about that in another video. So you can go over there and watch that if you so choose. Okay, uh, epilepsy. About 1 in 200 people have it in the United States. Globally, it affects about 1% of all people by age 20 and about 3% by age 75. So as you can probably imagine, um, the incidence of epilepsy does go up around age 50. It really starts to go up, and that's due to the increased incidence primarily of uh, neurodegenerative disorders. Epilepsy is basically chronic seizures. So a single seizure does not mean you have epilepsy. It means you had a seizure. Um, now, if you have another seizure and we don't know why that seizure is happening, so we know you didn't have encephalitis, we know you weren't withdrawing from alcohol, we know you weren't high on coke, then we start to think, okay, this is probably epilepsy. So you need to have more than one seizure in order to be diagnosed formally with epilepsy. Seizures are often preceded by something called an aura. Um, that's also known as a sensory experience, and it correlates to the epileptic event. So it's similar to the aura that you get with a migraine. It may not be similar in quality, but it's similar in that you get this sort of phenomenon and then the spell occurs after that. And so a lot of people with epilepsy will be able to tell you when a seizure is imminent. Uh, they may not remember the aura, uh, but if there's somebody around, they'll be able to say, oh yeah, I get this when I have my seizures. And then, you know, usually within seconds or a minute, um, then they begin to have the seizure, okay? Um, so this can manifest in so many different ways, and it really depends on where the epilepsy, where the seizure uh, originates from. Many of them originate in a specific lobe, um, so there's frontal lobe epilepsy and temporal lobe epilepsy, uh, and that often corresponds to the aura, um, not always, but often. Um, so uh, you can see here that there are a number of different ways that these auras can come about. And for many people, for most people, it's the same aura. You know, they'll have the deja vu and they know it and they get it and they know they're going to have a seizure. Um, so this is very, very important to understand because this is common with epilepsy. Now, certain conditions can trigger seizures and can trigger seizures in those who have epilepsy. So the common one that we think of is the flashing lights. And only a small minority of people with epilepsy have photosensitive seizures. Okay, photosensitive seizures are not the rule, um, but there are some things that are even more common in triggering seizures. Sleep deprivation is a huge one. Stress, emotional stress, physical stress can do it. Alcohol. Now, typically, drinking alcohol does not raise your risk of having a seizure. Being drunk does not raise your risk of having a seizure. Why? Well, because alcohol is a depressant. It actually raises your seizure threshold. The problem is, 
eventually you're going to have to come down from the buzz. And so as you're coming down, your seizure threshold is actually lower than it normally is. So the problem is not so much the drinking alcohol and the being drunk, it's the recovering from that. Um, and that's specifically where people will have an increased risk of seizure. Alcohol withdrawal, I put this more chronic alcohol withdrawal. So if you have an alcoholic and they stop drinking cold turkey, that is going to raise your risk of seizure in a person with epilepsy. And actually, it's going to raise the risk of seizure in anyone. You get delirium tremens. A big cause of seizures in an epileptic patient is medication non-compliance. So you've got a patient with diagnosed epilepsy. They've had epilepsy for five years. They're on Lamictal or they're on Dilantin or something. They're on a drug. And they come in with a seizure. One of the first things that you should be doing, as we're going to see, is that you need to check their levels. Now, it may be that they're non-compliant, or it may be that they started a new drug, maybe an antibiotic or something else, and that affected the metabolism of their seizure medication. And as a consequence, they had a seizure from that, a breakthrough seizure. Um, so that's something to consider. Tonic-clonic seizures are classically followed by a temporary post-ictal or post-seizure state, um, which is usually manifested as somnolence, but it can also um, look like acting out. I've seen patients come in, they're very aggressive. You know, the, I had one patient uh, who was, we had to lock the door and he had taken all his clothes off and had thrown things across the room. It's not acting out, it's post-ictal, it's confusion. Uh, sometimes they'll be somnolent. Sometimes they may even be cognitively impaired. They may lose the ability to read or to speak for some period of time, usually not a very long time, but that's called Todd's paralysis, and it's fairly common. Now, this is a very big diagram, as you can see, uh, but this is how we uh, classify seizures. Okay, so um, you can see that there are two categories of seizures, focal and generalized. A focal seizure used to be called a partial seizure, and it involves only one part of the brain. Now, with both of these, they're not going to lose consciousness, but they may have an altered awareness. Now, a simple focal seizure is just basically a tick. You know, they get a motor tick. Sometimes they'll have uh, psychic phenomena or autonomic symptoms, uh, but the patient is aware, and that's very characteristic of a focal seizure, a simple focal seizure. A complex focal seizure usually has some degree of altered awareness. They may be confused, but otherwise, um, symptomatically, it's similar to a simple focal seizure. Generalized seizures uh, are what we often think of when we think of seizures. So the first one is absence seizures. Some people are fancy and call it absence seizures. Or you could be even more French and call it a petit mal seizure. Okay, This is classically seen in children. Uh, the classic presentation of this is you've got a child who is you know sitting there, they're paying attention, they're doing something, and then all of a sudden they'll look off into space for a few seconds and you call out their name, they don't respond. And then all of a sudden they're right back to normal, okay? Sometimes they can get these automatisms, lip smacking, hand wringing, stuff like that, usually motor tics. Uh, but the classic thing about absence seizures is that they start and they end very abruptly. They tend to be in children, and then they, they just get this blank stare. They're staring off into space. That's classically how these are described. Tonic-clonic seizures are the stereotypical seizures that we think of when we think of somebody seizing, we think of convulsing, and that's a tonic-clonic seizure. It's fairly common. Um, what usually happens with these patients is that they'll be standing there, sometimes they'll have an aura, and they let out a loud moan, and that's just air coming out through closed epiglottis. And uh, they'll begin stiffening and convulsing. And typically this lasts about one to three minutes. If it lasts much longer, you need to think of status epilepticus or a non-epileptic seizure, which we'll go into. Um, a lot of times they'll have tongue biting, incontinence, urinary incontinence is very common. Um, now, if you have a patient coming in 
with tongue lacerations. If they say, you know, I've been sleeping well, I you know, have this bite on my tongue. If you have a patient that lives by themselves and they have tonic-clonic seizures, it's not going to be witnessed. So sometimes the only way you diagnose this is based on history. Um, so that can be really important. Now, myoclonic seizures, typically the patients are aware, not always, but many times they're aware. Uh, they get a sudden jerk uh, of part of the body, such as the arm or leg, and often they fall over. Atonic seizures, typically loss of consciousness. Uh, there's a sudden loss of muscle tone. It's very, very short, and they often wake up confused. And that's one way you can distinguish this from syncope. With syncope, you fall down, you wake up right away, and you're fine. With any kind of seizure, uh, aside from probably simple focal seizure, after the episode, there's a little bit of haziness and confusion. Now, there's also something called secondary generalized, and that's when you start with a focal seizure, and then all of a sudden you go into a generalized seizure, and typically here we're talking about grand mal's. Now, what do we uh, look for in history of a person coming in with a seizure? Well, we want to know a lot of things. History is very, very important. So we want to know what happened before or after the event. Was there any aura? A lot of times the patient won't be able to tell you this, but perhaps uh, somebody who witnessed the seizure may be able to tell you what the patient looked like, what were they doing right before they had the event. Were there any automatisms? Gives you an idea of the focus of origination. Neurologists will want to know that for when they're looking at the EEG. Has there been any trauma or drug or alcohol use? Uh, that's something that we're going to consider when we do our, our uh, workup. Most patients with epilepsy are physically normal and asymptomatic between events. These are often otherwise healthy people. What do we get for labs? So we get a pretty good battery of labs here. It's based on our differential. Uh, and some of these should be pretty common sense. So number one, a finger stick blood glucose. Hypoglycemia is a very common cause of, uh, of, of seizure. Um, so we want to rule that out right away because if somebody has hypoglycemia, it's a very easy it's, it's a very easy treat. You just, you know, give them dextrose. Um, so get a finger stick blood glucose, get a CBC, looking for the possibility of infection, get a basic metabolic profile, looking for uh, disturbances in sodium, uh, as well as uremia. Get a urine toxicology. There are a number of illicit drugs, cocaine, amphetamines, heroin, uh, fencyclidine, PCP, uh, GHB, um, they can all do it. Uh, serum ethanol, we're looking here for alcohol withdrawal. So it's hard to tell if somebody's withdrawing from alcohol or if they're drunk. Uh, but, you know, if you look for a blood alcohol level, um, you know, you, sometimes you have to ask uh, the patient's companion how much they've had to drink. And then if they, uh, you know, or if they have a 0 0.06 or something like that after a binge drinking, then you can be fairly certain they're coming down. Um, but, you know, th that can be difficult. But if you have a positive serum ethanol, you should definitely consider the possibility that this was alcohol induced. And then very, very importantly, and I'm going to exclamation point it, a head CT. We're looking for structural lesions here. We're also looking for the possibility of injury. A lot of these these people can fall down, hit their head. So we want to know about that too. We also want to know, is there an elevated intracranial pressure, particularly if you have a high white count, because that will be a contraindication to getting a lumbar puncture. Uh, remember other um, possible symptoms of elevated intracranial pressure while we're at it. Um, you know, you're thinking things like nausea, vomiting, diplopia, blurry vision, papilledema, cranial nerve 6 palsy. Uh, another one would be, you know, ultra level of consciousness, but you're often going to have that in a patient who just had a seizure. And then an EEG. That's not going to be done in the ER. That will be done eventually, though. Uh, it should be done in anyone with a seizure. Uh, this is a, a um, mnemonic. Vitamin D uh, is a mnemonic for a differential for seizures, so you can take or leave that. So these are your initial labs. Again, pointing out here um, some of the, uh, the differentials. Um, now, if you're taking CCS, you want to order seizure precautions and get IV access. If they have another seizure, you want that IV access. It's a lot easier to uh, run the IV when they are not seizing. 
Okay, so now what's epilepsy? As mentioned, epilepsy is uh, recurrent unexplained seizures. Most are idiopathic. Uh, however, there are seizure syndromes. Uh, the treatment uh, for epilepsy is anti-epileptic drugs. And this is going to be done by a neurologist. Uh, however, you should be familiar with many of the drugs that are given. And there are a couple seizure syndromes where you'll want to know the best drug. And you also will want to know what your broad spectrum anti-epileptic drugs are versus your more narrow ones. So anti-epileptic drugs are not, I repeat, are not started if it was the patient's first seizure. The only exception to that is if we're giving phosphenitoin to a patient with status epilepticus. All females of reproductive age should be tested for pregnancy before starting because pretty much all anti-epileptic drugs are teratogenic. All patients with epilepsy at some point should get a continuous video EEG to try to really nail down when they're having that seizure. And a lot of times these epilepsy floors or clinics will deprive them of their, um, of their, their medication. They will uh, force them to not go to sleep. It's kind of like medieval torture. Uh, but the idea is we want to get them to have a seizure so we can see what their seizure looks like. You know, they're in a safe place. They should be wearing a helmet, you know, but uh, we're trying to induce a seizure because that will allow us to better treat them. Uh, note that a normal EEG does not rule out epilepsy. I mean, you know, you might only have a seizure once every eight months. So what's the chances of you having a seizure when we do a 30 minute EEG, right? Some general principles, ethosuximide is the drug of choice for absent seizures, you should know that. Carbamazepine, oxcarbazepine, lamotrigine, and topamac, topiramate are good first-line agents for simple seizures or secondary generalized seizures. Valproate is typically the drug of choice for generalized epilepsy or unclassified epilepsy because it has a, a fairly good uh, spectrum. Um, so you can see here Valproate is under all of these. Um, now, other drugs that you could do that have good spectrum, broad spectrum of action are Lamotrigine and Topiramate. Um, you can see that they're all uh, found uh, here as well. Um, now, um, what, which drug you pick is, um, it, it's a complex decision. It's one that's made by a neurologist. And often you'll go with a drug and you'll try it and the patient will have a seizure and you have to increase the dose and um, maybe they have another seizure and you have to increase the dose. And then you decide maybe you want to change it or maybe you want to do dual therapy. Um, you know, it's, it's very complex and you will not be asked about it on the USMLE, aside from the fact that you will be asked if a patient has absence seizures, it's ethosuximide is the drug of choice. Now, if you're taking step one, you will want to know, unfortunately, the mechanism of action for these drugs. Um, so uh, a lot of them do work on uh, electrolyte channels, um, but some of them have a little bit different mechanisms. Uh, so you'll want to know that if you're taking step one, if you're taking step two or three, you don't need to know that. Some common differentials, migraine, obviously they're going to have a headache, uh, but they can get similar aura symptoms. Obviously, they're not going to have an impairment of consciousness. Stroke, look for focal neurosymptoms. Findings on CT, they may or may not have that. It may take some time. Often, we'll get a CT after three days with a stroke and then uh, and, and see if there's uh, evidence of ischemia. Febrile seizure, these are usually in kids with a very high fever. Uh, it doesn't require treatment. However, you may want to do something to work up the cause of the fever, um, so you may do a lumbar puncture or whatever. Uh, syncope, look for prodromal dizziness, sweating. So these patients may know, oh, I'm feeling dizzy. And they may tell someone and then they fall. The thing with syncope is they have an immediate recovery. So it's a very short loss of consciousness and they immediately recover. Uh, unlike epilepsy where they have that post-icto stage after a seizure. Psychogen psychogenic non-epileptic syndrome, also abbreviated PNES, you've probably seen that before, uh, is 
apparent seizures, but they are not due to epilepsy. They're not, as a matter of fact, they're not even real seizures. Um, so it is a type of conversion-like syndrome. Uh, the risk factors here are certainly a psychiatric history, like OCD or PTSD, that tends to be more common in females. And often, um, in many cases, these patients will be very traumatized. They may have a sexual abuse history. Uh, so you want to look out for that. Uh, the common thing with psychogenic uh, seizures is that they last a long time. Um, so they may last 5, 10, 15 minutes, and it can often be confused with, uh, with a status epilepticus. Uh, one of the things that you can do and what you should do, especially after somebody has a protracted seizure, is get a creatine kinase level. Okay, a creatine kinase level should go up after a genuine seizure because there's that contraction of muscles, that involuntary contraction of muscle. With PNES, they don't have that, okay? They are, you know, I don't want to say voluntarily, but it is to some, to, to a greater extent under voluntary control, and so they're not going to have that rise in CK. Um, so uh, consider that if you have a patient that kind of fits that profile who had what you think may have been status epileptic, it's a it's a good thing to get uh, because it may change your management. This should be a diagnosis of exclusion, though. These are some of the common causes of seizure and epilepsy. We're not going to go into all of these. Uh, one thing about EEGs that I want to point out, you will not be expected to read EEGs on any step of the USMLE. But one thing you will want to know about EEG is this phrase, 3 hertz spike and wave because that is diagnostic of absent seizures. Um, so you'll want to know that that is commonly tested. All right, so uh, let's recap here. Epilepsy is an idiopathic condition involving recurrent unexplained seizures. You always want to rule out your common causes of seizure like electrolyte imbalance, CNS infection, drugs, and structural lesions. Know your differentials. Um, you, if you know your differentials, it should not be difficult to know what you need to do as part of your initial workup. After stabilization, the best initial step is a head CT, looking for structural issues, looking for tumors, um, looking for increased intracranial pressure. If you're thinking the possibility that this could be an infection, you will probably want to have that CT to make sure that it's safe to proceed with a lumbar puncture. As far as treatment for uh, anti-epileptic drugs, there's no must for choosing an AED except for absent seizures where the first drug is ethosuximide. Valproate is often the right answer for generalized epilepsy because it's got a very wide spectrum. So choose it for any kind of generalized epilepsy except for absence. But I don't suspect you'll be asked about which drug to use apart from absent seizures. Adverse effects, all anti-epileptic drugs are teratogenic. Valproate is probably the worst. Uh, it can also cause TTP. Uh, Lamictal is infamous for causing Stevens-Johnson syndrome, which is that really nasty peeling rash that can be life-threatening. It can progress to toxic epidermal necrolysis. Um, so the important thing with Lamotrigine is that you start them up gradually, and then you stop them gradually as well. Uh, so you got to start them up very gradually with Lamotrigine because it is very dangerous if you start a large amount all of a sudden. Do not take pregnant women off her AEDs. You want to folate supplement her to decrease the risk of neural tube defects. Ultimately, though, the risk to her is if you stop the drug is greater than the risk to the baby if you continue it. So just start good folate supplementation. Surgery for epilepsy is commonly talked about, but it is reserved for patients who have uh, seizures that are poorly responsive to multiple medications, as well as having a well-documented focal lesion.